Hi folks, today we're going to have a look at this Sun Microsystems Sunfire V120 Enterprise Server. This came out back in June of 2002, sort of as a budget entry-level server uh, by Sun. It's in pretty rough shape. I think shipping it to me didn't do it any favors. <laughs> I haven't turned it on yet. It didn't come with a hard drive, but I think it's got some enterprise-y tricks up its sleeve, and I think we'll be able to get it uh, showing signs of life by the end of the video here today. I believe all the V-series Sunfires were more a budget-friendly option as compared to the other Sunfires in the lineup, supposedly bringing consumer PC pricing to this enterprise-grade gear. The base model, which I believe this is what I have here, retailed starting at $2,495 or about $4,273 adjusting for inflation here in May of 2023. Just for another data point, you would have spent around $2,000 for a consumer Pentium 4 machine from Gateway this same year in 2002, at least according to a scrape from their website October of that year. So when I said budget earlier, I really meant it. So Sun's enterprise gear of the era, any enterprise gear really was mind-bogglingly expensive, like just totally ridiculous. A so-called mid-range server setup from the Sunfire line, specifically the 6800 we're looking at here, would have cost you over 700,000 US dollars, or about $1.2 million in 2023 money adjusted for inflation here in May. But hey, they'd, they'd have it on its way to you in six days. So I've been eyeing these early 2000s Sun machines for a really long time, and I finally pulled the trigger. This one's seen better days, of course, but I love the attention to detail that the Sun designers put in aesthetically speaking. So like, there's no reason that they needed to put this incredible looking logo with the, the really nice matching color here on the top of this unit. It was going to be racked up with 10 others in a rack. No one was ever going to see it. I love that attention to detail. I think that's really been lost over the past couple decades. And I find it particularly unique for these Sun machines because it really goes to show that Sun at its heart, I think, was a hardware company back then. So for me, Anything from Sun deserves at least a little bit of respect due to all the great work they did over the course of the lifetime of the company. So that's enough talking. Let's jump into this thing, get it open. I'll show you what it's all about, what it's got going on, its problems, not least of which was the CPU fan or the CPU uh, heatsink was floating around inside when I got it. Uh, so we're definitely going to need to address that. It's kind of a mess. So let's open it up and see if we can't get it doing something. So this thing's got two hot swappable Ultra 2 SCSI drive bays up front. That's probably going to be a huge pain because Ultra 2 SCSI drives aren't exactly easy to come by these days. And over here we've got what's called the system configuration card. So basically this thing can hold the MAC address, IP address, I think, and other configuration settings for the server. And basically if this thing had some sort of physical issue and needed to be pulled out of service, you would pull its configuration card get another one set up with Solaris, the Unix system that this is meant to run, and we'll get into that later. Pop your card into the new one, and you'd be off and, and running again. So that's something sort of unique that Sun offered. And then, of course, under here, we've got the really thin optical drive bay. So let's get the lid off this thing and see what we're, what we're dealing with. Nothing too surprising in here. Actually, quite a bit of room. So uh, the CPU is passive-cooled. We'll, I'll show you a lot more of that later with this uh, shroud here. We've got a gigabyte total of PC-133, I think. So two 512 meg sticks. I think this thing can only handle up to four gigs total. Got the single power supply here. No redundancy there. And then a PCI slot here. Going around to the back, the power supply, the power input, like you'd expect, and a rocker switch. So up turns it on, I think down turns it off. When it's powered, it always is giving power to something called the lights off management system. And we'll talk about that in a second. So going all the way over to the right here, we've got two USB ports. They were probably pretty proud of that back then. Um, some system configuration lights, another SCSI port. So those two hot swappable drives up there are SCSI. And this is another one for peripherals or an external drive. We've got two 10 100 NICs. And then some serial ports. So this is a plain old serial port passed through to the operating system. And you can see this one says LOM, or Lights Off Management. So this was Sun's proprietary system for managing these things when they're powered down. And this, I'm hoping, 
I can interact with this thing without a hard drive. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. We'll see how it goes. And you can see here, this is actually that LOM chip on the board that runs lights off management stuff. All right, and then probably what most people have been waiting for, the processor. So this one has an UltraSpark 2i. Based on my research, I'm not convinced this is the one that's supposed to be in here. I think it's supposed to be a 2e. The 2e is better. <laughs> uh, so yeah, hopefully when we boot this up, we can see what this thing's all about. The Spark processors, of course, were some sort of competitor to Intel uh, in what made them sort of unique. I think it's risk-based, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, that's kind of coming back with ARM and Apple chips and everything. It's kind of interesting that Sun had been doing that, um, well, since the 80s anyway. This is a normal PGA 370 socket, you know, like you'd have for a Pentium 3 or something. And the little tabs where the heat sink is supposed to latch on are like totally gone on both sides. You can just barely see that one's totally gummed away too. So yeah, this is the main problem to solve here. What we'll try is turning this guy on. I should say giving this guy power and seeing if we can interact with the LOM, not actually boot up the system because of course we don't want to overheat it. I, I'm hoping that broke during transit, but it looks like it's been that way a long time. Uh, and just to reiterate, so obviously this slides on here and there's nothing anymore for <laughs> this to latch onto, but I think I've got a solution. All right, here's our setup. If you've watched before, <laughs> you know the drill. Got old faithful out here running Ubuntu, and it's got a serial terminal program running uh, with some pretty basic settings, what you might expect. I think that's what the Sun wants. I've got a special cable here for the serial connection, uh, DB9 on one side, going over to RJ45. actually made that cable for another appliance, an MRV secure serial console, uh, and that thing actually is what inspired me to get this, seeing that <laughs> that Java UI, and this is actually a machine that might have been controlled by something like that back in their you know, their period correct. Uh, so yeah, if you didn't if you didn't see that video, check it out. So what we're gonna do is we'll flip it on, and remember the heat sink isn't on the CPU right now. It's it's right here, in fact. Um, so when this thing turns on, I want it to be in in power off mode. So it'll have power, but the, the machine's not actually running. We shouldn't hear any fans doing anything. If it does, I'll rapidly try to turn it off uh, and then flip it off if I can't get it because we don't want that CPU running without a heat sink. And then hopefully we should see signs of life on the terminal. So let's try it out. All right, I'll point you at the screen and we'll we'll flip it on here. We stopped blinking, so I press enter, nothing. So, <laughs> no signs of life out of this either. All right, time to debug. I will be back. It is, of course, a totally different pinout for Serial than the cables I've already made for the MRV console, and also completely different than these adapters I got on Amazon. We've talked about these before. I don't know what these are for. I haven't encountered anything <laughs> that matches the pinout that those are for. So we are going to make yet another bespoke serial to RJ45 adapter. Oh, just me back with this thing again. If you had told me that I would use this more than once, <laughs> this RJ45 to DB9 breakout board adapter I made, well, I wouldn't believe you, but found the pinout online for the sun. So this should be wired up correctly now. Let's try to talk to the LOM again. All right, we're back with a slightly more convoluted setup. Coming out of the LOM, into my custom adapter here, into the serial port on this guy. Same terminal just sitting there. Let's fire it up. If this doesn't work, it could be there's no hard drive. So this whole time I've been talking about how I didn't have a hard drive, but I do. <laughs> I... I Unbox this like three weeks ago put this to the side and totally forgot about it So I do have a, a hard drive that it came with I have no idea if it works It's obviously very old, but that's good because it would have been a pain to find one of these scuzzy ones So if that doesn't work, we'll we'll get that in there. So let's let's turn it on uh Oh, hold on don't power on don't power on Okay 
This is great news. Sorry about the noise there. Look at that. The LOM is starting up. The adapter works. Oh, this is so cool. Look at this thing coming to life. And for some reason, it started to boot up right away. Not sure about that. Um, this NVRAM, NVRAM thing. We'll talk about that in a second. This is so exciting. Okay, so now the plan is we're going to fix this busted CPU cooler. And we'll do all that over again. So let's let's start. Okay, you'll you'll recall from earlier that the little tabs that this thing clips on were totally broken off on the board. You can't exact well, you could unsolder the socket, but that'd be a huge pain. So it's just a normal 370, you know, socket. So I've got this one that I picked up, and it's got the wider bracket. So there's actually other tabs that you can lock into. So these are chewed away, but there's one of these on either side of the socket still. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this apart and try to put this larger wide form factor tab into this one. And it's gonna be easy getting it off. It's not gonna be easy getting it back in here. So I'm gonna try that. Okay, so there's that. Now we'll get this one out. Uh, unfortunately, these are like stamped in. Um, not sure what I'm going to do. I mean, I might be able to pry this off, but it might, it might come to that. So yeah, I'll get cracking on this. All right, well, it'll either work or it won't. Um, it's more or less back together. It's got this really soft bottom. You can see I can make marks in it with my fingernails. It's like lead or something. I don't know if it's supposed to have thermal compounds. So I'm gonna do a little research. You can see it's been all banged up floating around in the case. Uh, I'm gonna do a little research before I put it in. So yeah, let's get this installed. Check it out. So this is what I was talking about, how there's another tab, obviously a similar one on the other side. There's the broken one. So these bigger form factor uh, tie down things can latch onto that. So yeah, that's looking good. It sh probably should have thermal grease. I, <laughs> I don't have any at the moment, so we won't run it for very long periods. I threw some dielectric grease on there just to have a little bit of something, but I know, I know, but we'll be okay. So yeah, let's hook this back up, power it on, and, and see what it's all about. All right, the lid's back on. I've got the screen recording over here for this historic occasion. <laughs> the, the first full boot of this V120 in a, what I suspect is a very long time. So let's power it on and see what we get. All right, there it goes. We're going to let it do its tests, uh, and then I'll power it off. And we should still be able to interact with it here. Okay, so if we can do pound dot to get into the LOM. So I typed pound then dot. We're here. Let's see what this thing... Yeah, it knows it booted up a mi two minutes ago. We can do power off. All right, so now the machine is off, but we can still interact with it with this lights off management, uh, which is pretty cool. So let's type environment, and it's going to spit out a bunch of stuff. It knows about its fans. It thinks all the supply rails are fine, which is pretty cool. It knows that the enclosure is 24 degrees Celsius right now, and it thinks that's okay. Let's take a look at show event log. So, yeah, so this stuff here was me booting the LOM, powering it on and stuff. Uh, and then we just turned it off here and we can see 929 days ago, the user password was changed and then it was powered off. So, so yeah, this thing hasn't seen life uh, in, in quite a while. It lives. 
the serial cable to the LOM worked. We were able to interact with it. We were able to read information from its environment settings. Super excited. So I don't want to run it very long when I don't have the right thermal paste on the CPU. I don't even know if I need it, but just to, we made it this far, might as well not mess it up. <laughs> so I have that on order. Next order of business is we'll get this over with the other servers. We'll get it hooked up through Telnet to that MRV console server. So, you know, there's a method to the madness here. And then we're definitely going to see what's going on with this hard drive it came with. So hopefully it's got a install of Solaris 8 or 9 on it already. That'd be really fun. And then we'll probably wipe it and see if we can't get it net booting. And we'll, after that, we can do all sorts of uh, cool Solaris stuff and start playing around. I've never really messed with it. My understanding is that's a sort of an exercise in pain, but <laughs> I'll bring you along. So we'll have a good time, I think. So yeah, really happy about this. This thing was in rough shape. Uh, really happy that it's working and I'm able to interact with it. And it seems to be doing good. Looks like it was like a 648 megahertz processor, I think it said. So maybe I was wrong about uh, that being the wrong one because that seems that seems pretty fast for this whole guy. So yeah, definitely more Sun Microsystem stuff coming. I've got another newer server uh, running some AMD with an AMD chipset that we're going to play around with too and get these things talking to each other running some old Solaris and, uh, you know, have a good time with them. So thanks for watching. Definitely more stuff to come and I'll see you in the next one. Got to move, buddy. Come on. You know the, come on. We're fixing computers. Don't, oh man. Don't do it.